Great finals? Yes? No? Okay. So you guys, guys in the back. Okay. Great finals? <laughs> So in the next five minutes we'll get started. Um, so grab a seat if you have it already. Um, grab some food for do so real quickly because we have a packed program and I want to make sure we have that opportunity to get all the content in tonight. So I'll start at the Wells Five. We'll begin the program at 6:34. All right. Thanks.
Justin and Shane, if you could just raise your hand so that we can Yay! recognize you. Thank you so much. Other folks involved uh, with this, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Hanking, uh, Vice President for Academic and Student Affairs, um, Dr. Carrie Pine, Associate Vice President for Academic and Student Affairs, and Dean of Students. I love titles here at Wells College. Uh, Dean of Student Staff in general, thank you so very much. Our student workers, our resident advisors, our student athletes, many of whom uh, and it's so good to see uh, so many of you all here as, as, as well. So thank you, and of course, um, there's the, the too numerous to mention, to be honest with you. Um, I also want to briefly welcome our panelists, but they will introduce themselves individually, um, and then we'll begin our program. Um, so we have Arian Roberts, Esquire. Dr. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Don Mesa Suris. Suplaris. Suplaris. I was practicing before, and to no avail. Um, last but certainly not least, uh, Dr. Ellen Strowski. So, um, some other housekeeping issues. Uh, there are three bathrooms on this floor. Um, to the left, my left here, is the ladies' room. And I say that because that's what it's labeled, the ladies' room. On the other side, down here, 
is the gentlemen's room, and then there is a gender neutral bathroom down here just around the corner from the gentlemen's room. Um, so maybe the kind of labeling of those restrooms could be a topic tonight. I don't know if that's apropos or not, but um, so those are where the bathrooms are. Um, like I said, we're here to celebrate a historic piece of legislation uh, that happened 50 years ago. Um, it's a piece of civil rights, but also human rights, and it has impacted all of us in this room. Not only impacted, but has done so significantly and positively, whether you know it or not. Um, but like any celebration, and this is a celebration tonight, don't get me wrong, and with any historic, anything that's historic, especially uh, a piece of legislation that has not changed in its 37 words, which is displayed up there as a reminder of its original wording, which has not changed in the last 50 years. But it has grown, evolved, it does have a history to it. Like everything that is significant and historical, it is not without its scrutiny, its shortcomings, its stigma, its progress, its oversight. And so we hope to have a meaningful, fruitful, but respectful discussion about all of those things, okay? Um, I also know that Title IX means a lot of things to a lot of different people. Um, and some of that has to do with types of sex discrimination, including uh, sexual violence, sexual misconduct, sexual assault. So this is kind of the disclaimer or trigger warning that we know and understand as you hear our panelists and our questions um, that this can stir up emotions for people. And that's perfectly understandable. Um, so we ask that if you would like support or you find yourself becoming emotional, um, we have Sarah Fessler, please raise your hand, who will be back there. Um, well qualified in counseling, problem solving, and especially active listening. So if you need some support, um, Sarah's here to help. Um, but if you need to step out um, for, the, for that reason, or a phone call, bathroom, feel free to do so. We don't have any scheduled breaks or intermission or anything like that, um, necessarily. Um, but just wanted to make sure that you're aware of that. So, how do we do this, have this fruitful, thought-provoking, and respectful conversation. So the structure for tonight is going to be, uh, in a moment I'll have um, Dr. Hanking have some remarks on behalf of the President. The President was not able to be here tonight due to a family emergency, um, but uh, certainly wishes that they could be here, and I'm sure would be very pleased to see this really amazing turnout. Uh, so we will, we will start with that, and after that the panelists will introduce themselves, and then we have a set of like general questions about the history or how uh, the panelists and others have been impacted personally and professionally by Title IX. Um, talking a little bit about the future, just giving kind of, kind of a broader, um, larger kind of scoped questions. And then we also have some designed um, questions that take a little bit of a deeper dive into some of the areas that uh, either stigma or some things that are controversial, positive, just things of that nature. And so we wanted to do that first and then have uh, provide an opportunity at the end, about 25 minutes or so, depending, um, for a Q&A session. Most of you should have seen, um, when it came in, one of these, uh, which has a QR code. If you don't, I have some up here, and I think there's some others that can pass them around or you can share them. So with the questions, how we're trying to do this to, to best make this smooth, run as smoothly as possible. Um, scan the QR code, it'll take you to a form where you optionally can provide your name or not, um, and then the questions will come up and I will actually have them here at the end, and I will promise you to try to get to as many questions as I can uh, that you have for the panel or myself or you know anything that you wanna bring up um, to, to discuss within the realms of what we're here to, to, to talk about and celebrate tonight. So, any questions about any of that? The QR code, the format, the structure, food? All right. Well, thank you again. Um, I will turn the mic over for some brief remarks uh, by Dr. Susan Henke. Before I say anything else, I think there's one person who didn't get thanked yet. Who? Jeffrey. from Professor Gibraltar, uh, but I want to start with something that I know he would agree to ask him. Raise your hand if you were alive in 1972. You're holding up very well. Okay? There's a few of us in the room who were born, in, born before then and were alive in the 70s. 
For those of you who know President Gibraltar, you know that we have certain things in common, certain things we don't have in common. I, for example, have hair. <laughs> however, however um, he, what he wrote for tonight, and I do know he's very sorry not to be here, is for me very interesting because we're very close in age. I'm actually a little bit older. So I'm going to read you a little bit about what he wrote and then I'm going to say something about my own experience because you know one of the significant differences between Jonathan Gibraltar and Susan Henking and it's not that both of our names are preceded by titles okay, or that we work at Wells. So here's part of what he wrote. I began my college career in 1975 and graduated in 1978. Title IX went into effect in 1972. It was actually written into law by, does anybody know who was president? Oh, oh, oh Mike does. Abraham Lincoln. There you go, oh, it's true. Oh, if the rights had been there for that long. Um, it was Richard Nixon. So he signed it into law on June 23, 1972. And June 23rd, President Gibraltar wanted me to remind you, is coincidentally was his birthday. Over the years that he has spent since 1975, there have been federal lawmakers who've tried to change or omit Title IX. There's also been a whole range of things in higher education that are affected by it. Federal funds operate all sorts of programs. So if anybody here, don't raise your hand, has Pell money, that's federal money. So that's a form of financial aid that makes Title IX relevant to all of us. So all of these activities are supposed to occur without discrimination based on sex, sexual orientation, and gender identity, with the latter two end added as a part of the interpretation of that text up there. Now, here's President Gibraltar. From the time I started my collegiate career as an undergraduate student, through my 35 years working in higher education, including these past 22 years as a college president, Title IX has guided my life and been an important focus of my belief system. That is that every person deserves every opportunity to succeed in higher education, and every person who has an identified need to receive federal financial aid has the protection of the institution that they chose to attend. That's important. That's also a statement of institutional commitment. Now, I will admit it, I was already in college when John got there. So I started college in 1973. 1972, Title IX is passed. I entered college the year after my alma mater closed the women's college. I graduated from college the year before women got the right to have credit cards in their own names. That's 1978. I'm old, folks, I get it. The reason I'm telling you this is here's a few illustrations of things people have said to me or have occurred to me across a lifetime. Right? One is I did play split court basketball. Um, it shocks people because mm, couch potato. But it is also true. In high school, women, when I was growing up, women's sports and men's sports were completely unrelated activities. The ball was different in the two sports. The court was different in the two sports in different ways than it is now. When I went to college, I went to a basketball power, folks. Some of you have heard me say this. I'm the only living Duke alum who doesn't care about basketball. <laughs> they did not actually treat women athletes the same as they treated men athletes. Um, the, seriously, we all knew them. They, it was very, very, very different. And Title IX have helped to change that. We're not done, or we wouldn't be discussing pay equity for women athletes, for example. Here's a few other things. When I went to graduate school, there was a building. It was quite large. It had no women's rooms in it at all because the expectation was that men went to graduate school in religious studies. I had a colleague, that was in the 70s and the 80s. I had a colleague write to me who went to the University of California, Berkeley as a student and then taught there for 10 years and worked in a building that was five stories tall and didn't have a women's room. There was no gender neutral bathroom either. She went down the stairs, out the building, fortunately it was not upstate New York, to another building to use a women's room because there were no women's expected to be scientists. 
Now, if I keep going, right, um, we can get to what John Gibraltar and Susan Henkin have in common. In 1972, when this was passed, there were 23% of American college presidents were women, 23%. If anybody can get the percentage for this year, I will buy you dinner at 1833. Okay? Except them. They probably know. <laughs> it's 29%. 50 years and 6 percentage points. So that's a reminder. It changed the world. Because, by the way, we're supposed to be paying men and women, college presidents, the same. Eh, not so much. But having said that, look at how much more work there is to be done in athletics, in educational access, in the lives we all share. I, by the way, find ladies' rooms rather weird. You've met me, not my thing. But it's also really important to remember one other thing about all this. It's weird that we squabble so much about bathrooms, but we've done it before. We did it to stop the Equal Rights Amendment, which is about to have its 100th anniversary. It's called the Lucretia Mott Amendment. It was declared in Seneca Falls by a really annoying, not very inclusive woman named Alice Paul. And all it said was women have the right, it's phrased much better than this, to be considered equal in the United States. It's much shorter than this, right? So I'm saying from the vantage point of being a geezer and a couch potato, if you start looking at the things you take for granted, some of them are only because a guy who, by the way, got impeached, signed this into law. It was a bipartisan agreement. It was Republicans and Democrats and independents. The very few women then in Congress, almost all of whom went to women's colleges, and the men in Congress, and it was a national movement led by a person who I think we should revere, named Bunny Sandler, best name ever. So it's really, for me, part of the reason to celebrate this is that you are here. You are here. And that's partly because somebody stood up and said, everybody should have access to federally funded higher education. So I can't wait to hear what you say and what you ask. And See if anybody can stump one of them. Thank you for being here, folks. And yeah. I could have Thank you, Dr. Hanking, for your personal and powerful narrative, as well as your channeling of President Gibraltar. Um, so uh, I'm going to ask our panelists now to introduce themselves, and then we'll begin with the scripted questions and hopefully have some time to get some of your questions in as well. By the way, if you're watching and wondering why I'm up here, I forgot to mention that I, my name is Jeffrey Gabriel, and I'm the Title IX coordinator here, so this is why I'm sort of um, I'm seeing the event, if you will. Uh, but without further ado, um, and in any order uh, you would like, if, if our esteemed panelists could introduce themselves and provide a brief introduction. Hello everyone, it's great to be here. Um, I'm Dr. Don Mesa Souffler, as Jeffrey said before, and I currently serve as the Vice President for Student Development and Campus Life at Montclair State University University in uh, uh, Northern New Jersey. It is a public institution in New Jersey. It has about 22,000 students. Um, it is a Hispanic serving institution as well as a um, minority serving institution. It is a Division Three athletic program of about 24 teams. Um, I've been there about two years. Prior to that, I served as the Vice President for Student Development and Enrollment Management at LaSalle University, which is in Philadelphia. You may know it from its basketball program and Division I uh, athletics program. And then prior to that, I served in a variety of, of uh, positions, but uh, as the Associate Vice President for Student Affairs at RIT, Rochester Institute of Technology, as you know, down the road. And that's where, actually, uh, Dr. Pine and I really started right around the same time, and we have been friends and colleagues since. So that's, uh, I'll tell you very briefly a little bit of my origin story, um, is that I'm a first generation uh, Latina woman. My dad uh, is Mexican American, my mom was Irish. And um, I always knew I wanted to go to college. They were very supportive, but as first generation 
student. Do we have any first generation students in the room tonight? Say, I know my parents didn't know how to support me. And there was no conversation about Title IX. I was eight when Title IX was signed into law. I did not know anything about it until I went to college, and it was really later in college that I figured out how it would impact me. As I go back and I look, I know that I played on the boys' soccer team when I was in high school because they hadn't started a girls' soccer team, and the only time I got to play in a game is if the other high school had a girl on the team. There were two out of the 15 schools that my high school played had a girl on the team. So I traveled a lot on the bus with, uh, no offense to the men in the room, but stinky boys who played <laughs> soccer. And uh, there were four women. And we were allowed to practice and do all that. We were only allowed on the field if there was another woman on the field. Little did I know that that was very connected to Title IX, and then later on they developed a soccer team. So as we go through this, I'll talk a little bit more about how Title IX has influenced me both career-wise and as a woman of color and also as a professional, but I want to turn it over and let my esteemed colleagues introduce themselves. Thank you, uh, Don. That was, that was pretty awesome. Uh, my name is Arian Roberts. I serve as the Deputy Athletics Director at Ithaca College. I also um, through NCA designation and the senior woman administrator. I have so many roles uh, there. A lot of them include sports supervision. Uh, we have 27 teams. I supervise 15 of them. Um, I also oversee strength and conditioning. Our clinical athletic trainers, um, as well as some leadership development. Compliance is probably my primary responsibility outside of sports supervision. Um, and I also serve as a deputy Title IX coordinator um, for the college. So I help. Our, our, court, our Title IX coordinator quite a bit uh, in her role and capacity um, at the college. Prior to IC, I served uh, for five years as uh, Assistant Athletic Director at Slippery Rock University in uh, Slippery Rock, Pennsylvania. It's a Division II institution, so IC is Division III. Uh, Slippery Rock is Division, uh, Division II. And then before that, I spent two years at Miles College in Birmingham, Alabama, also a Division II institution. My gateway to athletics was through law school. I did my undergrad and law degree at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, and, and while I was there, I absolutely knew I wanted to do something related to athletics. My primary love was um, the LPGA, I think. Oh. Got some LPGA lovers over here. So uh, coming up, like uh, golf was uh, something that I revered and found and was really quite fond of, primarily because it was the only time I saw women in a professional sport. Um, it was the time, you know. Now WNBA is, is kicking and thriving, which is awesome. But before that, uh, golf was really the only exposure I had to professional women athletes. It was always the WTA, um, but. Living in Dayton, Ohio, I had an opportunity to um, volunteer at some of our, LP, our LPGA classics that we sponsored. And I'm, you know, a nine, ten year old, and here Laura Davies is walking by me, Annika Sorenstam, Meg, da you know, Meg Allen. Um, I'm probably naming people that maybe you all don't know, but um, it was incredible. And I wanted to be part of that. I wanted to do that every day. So when I went to law school, my hope was. I'll do work, I'll open my own um, women executive firm, handle all the sports agency, I'll do all their marketing, it'll be great. Women are gonna be awesome in athletics. And um, being in Pittsburgh, I had an opportunity to mentor with some sports agents and I hated it. I was like, this is horrible, like I don't wanna have anything to do with this, um, but I still wanted to do athletics. And had a wonderful mentor, judge there, Dwayne Woodruff, who geared me, or steered me toward athletic compliance. Um, and that's kind of how I got my foot in the door and started in athletics. So um, it's kind of how I ended up here again, like Don said, we'll talk a little bit more about um, what we're doing, especially our story related to Title IX and some of the ways um, that it's impacted and really made a difference in our lives. Hi, everybody. Uh, can you all hear me OK? Yeah. Um, um, Thank you so much for this opportunity to visit with all of you tonight. Um, and Mike Lindberg, um, we were longtime colleagues at the college, so it's so nice to see you and Dawn um, and, and 
uh, Dr. Hanking um, from William Smith days and Carrie from William Smith days. So wow, um, this is just like a big old homecoming here. So it's wonderful to be here. Um, in terms of a little bit about my background, uh, I started out um, in high school really um, having um, sort of flickering ideas about what I wanted to do. And there wasn't really, at that time, kind of a name for this hunch that I had. I had interest in media, I had interest in law, and I had interest in sport. And this was in 1973. So sort of the only game in town at that point for me was to become a physical education major at Ursinus College, a small liberal arts institution west of Philadelphia. Um, and uh, I, I was recruited out of there um, by a, a coach from Ithaca, actually, to get my master's degree in sports psychology. That was completely eye-opening for me. Um, I thought when I graduated with a degree in health and physical education that that the best kind of career would be that I would coach junior high school field hockey, lacrosse, and softball, um, and that, um, that I'd, I'd teach um, health courses. That was really what I thought I was going to be doing. Um, and, and then uh, you know, I got this degree in sports psychology. Um, before I turned 24, I was the head coach of two sports at Oberlin College. Um, that put me on the fast track to become a director of athletics by the time I was 28. Um, at a time when only 8% of um, athletic directors were women. Um, still, um, still questing, still trying to find a space where I could put all of these interests together. Um, I was studying for my doctoral degree while working full time. At times I was commuting to Temple University from Geneva, New York, um, working on my doctorate in, in, the, in sport management at that time. Um, and eventually I ended up landing, my great good fortune is that I landed at Ithaca College where they were creating a sports media major. Um, and so I've had the honor and privilege of working um, uh, at Ithaca College in the Roy H. Park School of Communications um, with all manner of um, students who are interested in broadcasting, interested in writing about sports, interested in, um, in being on the production side, our tech guys, um, who I value so much um, uh, for helping us tonight. Um, so so that, that's a little bit about my story. Um, along the way, uh, I had this sense that, that uh, for a very shy person who does not like to get up in front of audiences, uh, I, I had this sense that um, that, that, that there was something that, um, that kind of like a voice that, that needed expression. Um, and I whispered to my grandmother when I was about seven years old um, that, that I thought I would someday write a book. And that, that seemed like an out-of-body experience at the time um, because, you know, you can't reel that back in once you say it, to, you know, to Graham. You know, you can't reel it back in again, right? Um, so um, I'm perched on um, publishing my fourth book, um, in the springtime um, on uh, what we call pro college profit athletes. Um, I've been working in the college athletes strike space. Um, some of you may be following along with the NIL conversation. Um, my uh, research in terms of personal branding college athletes, um, my work has been underneath that. And then my work has also dealt quite a bit um, with gender equity and with race issues as well. Um, so I bring all of that to the table um, in terms of our conversation tonight, and um, thank you so much for the opportunity to visit with you. Thank you, panelists, and thank you again for, for being here. What an eclectic group we have with so much knowledge and history and impact professionally and personally. Which kind of leads me into our, our first question. I'm going to kind of combine the first two questions here because I think the panelists in their introduction have tapped into this a little bit. So um, I would ask um, in, in any order, and, and how you would like to share to talk a little bit more about your preferred personal and professional impact of Title IX, 
And then also we have a group that I think we all know a little bit about uh, Title IX, but we may not know some of the specifics. Like I'm sure, um, we're, let's talk shop for a second. So we know about the Dear Colleague letters and we know about the evolution and we know about its, its application to athletics and then its expansion later on um, uh, with oversight and, and uh, to, to tackle the piece of sexual misconduct um, at our colleges and institutions. And so notably, um, you know, changes in athletics, the expansion, the oversight. Um, uh, in the early, when I came onto the scene was in the early um, 2010s, and uh, you know, Joe Biden, then President Biden, had a task force about sexual assault on college campuses, and that really drove um, its application of Title IX to expand it, not only from the Department of Education, but the Office of Civil Rights, the Department of Justice, and, and really gave it more teeth, more kind of power and influence, because in 2000, we had legislation about what colleges and universities were supposed to do to protect our students from sex discrimination, including sexual assault. And that was largely unheard of, um, or, or, or people were not listening, until we had some other Dear Colleague letters, notably in 2011 and in 2014. We've had regulation changes, so if any of this speaks to you uh, personally and professionally, if you could just touch base on any of those things. Um, I'm, I'm happy to start. So I talked a little bit about my, my origin story, but I'm going to fast forward a little bit. And so when I was finishing college, I didn't really know what I wanted to be in life, but I was a very involved student. In fact, I had seven majors as an undergrad, not all at the same time. Um, I had started off in one major, didn't go well, and I was a good student, but I just was that student that just didn't know what they wanted to be. But I was a very, very involved student at Binghamton University in the SUNY system. And I had a great mentor who said, you know, you can do this thing called student affairs. And that is helping students. You can help with athletics. You can help with the residence life. You can help with counseling and uh, university health and clubs and organizations. And there's a master's degree for that. And that's what you should do. And so that's what I did. It sounded great. And so 32 years later, here I am as a vice president of a large institution. But while I was starting my career, and I started in residence life, and I had been an RA as an undergrad, and then was a resident director as, a, as both a graduate student as an, and as a professional, um, what I noticed very quickly was the issue of sexual assault, harassment, and discrimination, particularly um, in my day in the residence halls. There had been uh, some national cases that brought a lot of attention, including um, the, this, a case that has a, the the Cleary Law, um, which there has been just a, a very, very significant rape and killing of an undergraduate student at Lehigh University, um, and you know, sent just waves through the community of parents and young undergraduates going, it, our college is safe. And it really wasn't the issues of somebody jumping out of, of a bush or from behind a car and sexually assaulting someone, but it was more about peer to peer. It was students to students, trying to understand how to have relationships, where the issue of alcohol fell in, where the issues of other drugs fell in, about how to engage in a relationship and have everybody feel that they're respected in that process. And so I found myself pretty quickly when I was in residence life dealing with some of those issues as a young professional. My career path took me into the field of student conduct. So I spent 15 years as the Chief Student Conduct Officer for RIT, which meant that all sexual assault, harassment, discriminations between students, or if a student was a, a victim or an alleged victim, went through my office. And that was right around the time when these Dear Colleague letters started coming out from the government to say, colleges and universities, you're not doing enough. We are hearing that there are sexual assaults happening on campuses that potentially are not being handled the way they needed to be handled. And so it was pretty eye-opening, particularly in 2011 when we got a Dear Colleague letter, and the Dear Colleague letter changed the face of how colleges and universities dealt with sexual assault, harassment, and discrimination. We were now told, again, those 37 words never changed. But the interpretation changed that there was an onus on the university that we needed to provide hearings, fair hearings, which I think many schools were doing, but maybe there were some that were not. There needed to be a Title IX coordinator, and so that started the evolution of what Jeffrey does for a living now. 
It started off on making sure that we were educating students about these, about these issues and that there were dialogues on campus about college student experience. And so while the athletic piece is a very, very important piece that I think has touched all of us, I, want, I just wanted to mention that really that has been a, a central piece for me is the sexual assault side. Then we saw a Dear Colleague letter come out again in 2017, it was one in 2014, but 2017 where everything that we had been doing in 2011 changed on, pretty much on the dime. It was a new administration, Trump administration went and changed many things about how we were managing sexual assault, harassment, and discrimination. We now have another change in having the Biden administration, and we have another set of regulations that are not in place yet, but should be in place someday soon. So it has been a, a much of a roller coaster for me working with students about how we talk with each other, how to have relationships, but also about accountability education and making sure that everybody feels heard, everybody feels safe, and everybody feels respected. So just to give you a little bit more of a background of how it's impacted me in my career. Don't you just love lawyers, I don't you? <laughs> um, so first, some, first time, <laughs> uh, all the, all, all the, all the, all the, all the <laughs> So uh, first, I have my iPad here. There's a lot going on in my head. Um, I forget stuff a lot, so I'll, I'll look at my notes just to make sure I'm, I'm staying on, on point. And, and, I, and I'm a learner, so I'm incredibly honored to be sitting between uh, these two women. So I'll probably be taking notes um, as you both as you both talk as well. So a couple of things that um, actually Don said that reminded me of. Again, additional ways that I kind of got here, and I know uh, we'll touch on this a little bit, but again, Donna hit on a couple of things. So we mentioned first generation students. Um, I am a third generation, so let's just think about. So my parents went to and graduated from college. My grandparents went to and graduated from college. Now, my grandparents went to historically black colleges and universities, but in, in Alabama State. But it's very rare, I would say, for somebody in my position to have. Uh, such a generation of education and, and wealth of, of education um, to be super proud of and have that and have that lineage. My family is heavily involved in politics. So my father was an elected official in Ohio. He was the state legislature legislature there. Um, Ohio has term limits, so he served as term limits as state representative. Then served by uh, term limits as a state senator. Uh, my brother worked for um, a senator uh, as one of his um, directors uh, from Ohio. My mother currently works uh, as, for a congressman as a regional director. I've worked on Capitol Hill. Um, I've worked for actually the congressman that my mother works for, works for now. So my family is deeply rooted into politics and a lot of the things that we'll talk about today revolve around politics, revolve around administration. And one of the things I've learned, whether it's about athletics, whether it's about um, how we manage or navigate our educational experience, our athletics exp athletic experience, and I preach this to my student athletes so much, you all have to be involved in your participation, your governance of how your education um, is, is being administered. So whether it's athletics, whether it's you know, just in general education, uh, voting is going to be super important, your engagement, uh, and again, whether it's at a, a student-athlete governance structure or a large-scale large state, federal, local uh, type of thing, you really have to be involved in that because how, again, these laws get passed, how these laws um, change in terms of inter interpretation really depends on uh, largely who's in office. So some of those things you're going to really have to keep in mind and keep track of as much as possible. I was glued to the TV last night, not sure if anybody else was, but I definitely uh, was glued to the TV. I know we'll touch a little bit more on, on, on politics, but uh, that has been a huge uh, segue again into how I've kind of ended up in, in this place uh, in athletics. In terms of, you know, Title, title IX has sort of been a, a job creator for me. I'm looking to next spring and I'm going to be teaching a course on Title IX. 
Um, and, and that's one thing that I think is so interesting is that we can have one law that warrants one full course and, and actually more than that. Um, as, a, as a coach, um, it was very interesting to see my athletes observe inequalities that were going on in their program and to um, pursue a complaint with the United States Department or Department of Education through the Office for Civil Rights. Um, and that early on in my career as a young coach, uh, for um, uh, my athletes to do that, um, certainly my administration was um, pushing that on me a little bit at that time um, because, um, because schools, schools sometimes do not comply um, and, uh, and, and, and these are actually part of the political tensions that come up. Um, so I've had the experience of going through complaints. Uh, I've had experience consulting on lawsuits. I've done a lot of work in terms of research. Um, you know, one of the tidbits in this 50th anniversary year, um, we did a research study with the Women's Sports Foundation last spring, um, sort of assessing how we were doing in terms of um, the application of Title IX in athletics 50 years later. At, at the college level, um, the, all of the indicators are that the vast majority of schools are actually not in compliance. Um, and so 50 years later, um, you know, I, I, think, I think our vision of the future, coming back to this question, well, why is that? Um, and why is it that $750 million in athletic scholarships um, are, are not going to women? So that, that's the, the kind of work that I've been doing. I, I will say that, that, that this is part of a, a set of civil rights laws. And it's helpful and important to understand that, it, especially in terms of the political currents. But, but it's also, I, I think in, in the 50th anniversary year, we're also talking about the limitations of Title IX. Title IX is what's called a single access law, which means that we're looking at, at gender um, uh, and, and gender stereotyping, um, discrimination on the basis of gender. Um, and so when we look at the landscape um, in terms of opportunities um, through a racial lens, we see that women of color are oftentimes left behind even, even with this theoretical emphasis on fairness in terms of gender. Um, so, so in this 50th year, we're looking at uh, the, the fact that, that we've got to be thinking not just according to Title IX, but we also need to be thinking um, about the, the full array of, um, of human experience um, and thinking about how we can um, use Title IX as one piece of this larger puzzle. Um, so I'll leave it there for the time being. Thank you. I appreciate all the comments. Um, quick impromptu. Can everybody do me a favor? And I'll just, just stand up just for a second. Um, I know it's a little bit warm in here. Um, I know that the content is very interesting, but I want to make sure that we all maintain our energy. Stretch a little bit if you have to. Say hello to your neighbor. All right. Okay. We'll, uh, we'll get started again. Sorry about that. You all take your, your seats. So if you take your seats, we'll, uh, we'll continue. Energize and renew. So uh, a couple more general questions that I have for our panelists. They have questions based on it. Um, so it's a, it's a perfect segue. Um, I think one panel in particular was talking about some of the, the shortcomings, but I also I want to elaborate on that a little bit more about um, it's a celebration, but it's also, as we mentioned, not met without its scrutiny. It does have some shortcomings, has changed, evolved over the years, um, possibly you know, talking a little bit more about the, the initial application, which was the athletics piece. Um, and again, kind of tying it into how you are personally and professionally in, in, impacted by that. Um, and some of the, because you mentioned as well, it's, it, it is politicized and it changes as administrations change. We've seen that, we're going through it now, we've been through it you know, just four years ago, it seems like. Um, and these were regulation changes, not just the Dear Colleague letters, which were suggestions. These were actual, literal changes that we had to do. So the landscape has changed. I think everybody hit on that very well. 
Um, so, so there is politicized, but there's also stigma about what Title IX is, what it isn't, um, and, and it means a lot of things to a lot of different people, panelists especially here, but all of us really. When we hear or see Title IX, we think of something. I don't know what that is, and maybe we can share it during the Q&A session, but to talk about some of the, um, or maybe perhaps uh, debunking myths, um, any, anything along those lines that comes to, comes to mind. juxtaposition in terms of um, Title IX in the athletics area. Um, one, of the, um, one of the narratives that has played out in terms of Title IX's impact on athletic departments um, is the fact that um, there's a perception that men's sports are going to, are, are, um, are being eliminated as a result of Title IX. Um, and when you actually look at the data, when you look at the data from 1972 to the present, what you see is um, what you see is you, you see a trajectory of both of, of growth for both men's and women's sports. Okay, it's a growth upward trajectory upward for both men and women. Okay, so this idea that Title IX um, uh, threatens women's sports or, or threatens men's sports. Um, is really more of a myth than reality, okay? Where, where we do see shifts and differences, we might hear that a baseball team is cut somewhere or a men's golf program is cut someplace, that you really have to look at all of the numbers in order to really appreciate what's actually going on. Because the average squad sizes for football, for example, or a lacrosse program, a men's cross program might actually be going up around the same period of time that a, a men's swimming and diving team is getting cut. So, so it, it's important to kind of look at the whole picture to see what's actually going on and where the resources are shifting and changing. Um, and I, I think a good example of this is a school like James Madison University, which had been a mid-major um, uh, kind of football Goliath um, and, and was aspiring to get into the power five. Um, and, you know, it, it sort of, you know, historically they cut um, 11 sports at one point. Most of those sports were men's sports. Um, and um, when, when you followed kind of the bouncing ball and what was actually going on there um, is that they had made a business decision that they wanted to invest in a big time football program. Um, and so, um, and so you can see that all of the resources were going into that that football program. Okay, so you you really have to take a look at the total picture in order to understand what's actually going on there. So that's one of the most prevailing myths that we've had in terms of Title IX. I'll also add to um, from an athletics perspective again from a, a myth. Um, these are some of the stats I'm, I'm going to read real quick. So in 1972, just prior to Title IX, women held 90% of the head coaching positions uh, for women's teams. So I have the stats for Division I, but I'm going to read uh, the stats for uh, specifically for Division III since that's what we're all familiar with. Women now hold less than half of the head coaching jobs for women's teams and only a handful of the women's, um, women coach men's teams. And if anybody recently saw uh, from um, uh, Julie Sitch just won the national championship uh, from in men's, men's soccer. So uh, awesome, awesome job uh, for, for her. But so most recent EADA data shows, um, and this is uh, over 3,700 coaching jobs being reported for men's teams, um, 1,747 coaches are men and 88 are women. <laughs> For women's teams, 1,024 coaches are men, 890 coaches are women, and then for co-ed teams, 15 coaches are men and six are women. And that's for Division Three. I would say Division Three is probably going to be doing a lot better than the other divisions. Um, I'm going to have those stats uh, in, in in my in my bag, but you're going to see a huge decline as you go up in divisions from the jobs that are being that are available 
um, I wouldn't say available, that women are being hired for in terms of coaching. Um, again, what you see what happened in the shift, awesome job from Title IX to create these wonderful athletics opportunities uh, for women, but because now look at all the resources that are being pumped into them, oh look, now uh, these jobs are more favorable, these are more attractive, all these resources, and so men are more interested, and again, I think just in general unconscious bias and hiring practices and, and how that kind of happens, um, men all get, get more jobs. So uh, we look at the trend, upward trend trajectory, like Dr. Dr. S says, more opportunities for men in terms of sports, but also more opportunity um, for jobs as these women's sports programs, I would say, continue to grow. Every time I hear Dr. S, I, I, I'm Dr. S also. So my, at my university, my sister's call me Dr. S too, so I keep going, I didn't say that. Oh, no, oh. I think it's just Dr. S. <laughs> and the thing is, I only call her Dr. S because my students call her Dr. S. I, so, I mean, I know, it's, it's crazy. Like, everybody, no. everything goes <laughs> I'm going to take it to uh, outside the athletic realm, though I think my colleagues here did a wonderful job in talking about that. I think that some of the, the misconceptions and myths that I've heard from students quite often is that, number one, um, that any of the, of the regulations or anything that came out of the, your colleagues' suggestions, that universities were given extra monies to put those things in place. And that was not the case at all. In fact, we were basically told in college and universities, you are to put all of these things in place. You're going to hire Title IX coordinators, have deputy coordinators doing um, programming, make sure that you have appropriate hearing boards. You, I mean, it goes on and on and on in a list, but not, not a university, college university in the country got an additional re a piece of resources or, or monies to do that. And so college universities scrambled, and still scrambled to this day, to try to make sure that we're adhering to the regulations, to the spirit of what it, it is supposed to be, but without having any extra monies to do so. So that has become something, I think we've gotten used to it a little bit now, but when this all first happened, particularly in 2011 and moving forward, and um, Dr. Pinan will remember we had conversations going, where is this money going to come from? And then who are these professionals that are going to take these roles on that have not had the training yet? Now there's a career path to do this work, but it was not that way in the 90s or the 2000s, even through 2011. People didn't know that that was going to be their career. So it has been a very interesting path, not only for the athletic side, but also for just general student conduct behavior and the experience of college students and, and, and professionals at colleges and universities. It has been a very interesting time. And the last thing I want to say quickly is that I, get, I, I have had students say to me, when will all of this be resolved? When's the end of this where you know, things keep changing and this administration gets very politicized and, and you know, the, I call it the pendulum, right? So the pendulum has swung to have, be more focused on victims' rights, and then the pendulum s swings to more focused on accused rights, and you know, when will the pendulum come in the middle? We talk about athletics, and when will things like uh, female coaching and having some equity there, when is that all going to get resolved? And I think, and I think, you, I hope you will both agree with me, it's not ever going to end. Right. It is going to continue to be evolutionary, it will evolve, and as we move forward, it will continue to change and never fully be something we can check the box off and move forward to something else. Because things and, and society keeps evolving. So this is something that's not just going to be resolved tomorrow or by a new president or by a new administration and a different political party. This is something that will be with us for good or bad, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly. It is going to be with us for your lifetime, it has been for most of our lifetimes, and will continue, it never will fully be resolved. And I think we have to learn to live in some of that ambiguity, in some of that this little nebulous, because that's just what we have, and we're just gonna have to continue to have dialogues and education and understanding, because this isn't ever really going to end. Thank you.
very, very insightful. Um, I think that what we've accomplished so far is a really good digging into the main topics and to kind of piggyback off the remarks that our panelists just had about this question, um, I'm gonna ask you humbly to kind of dig into uh, your crystal ball and your own experiences and optimism or lack thereof, whatever it may be. And my question in general is what, what is the future of Title IX? You know, that it's not going anywhere. There is a pendulum and an overcorrection and, and it seems to be in a perpetual state but what, what is the future like, ideally? Do you think it's going to thrive? Do you think it's going to survive? Um, uh, expand, retract, all those things, none of those things? Uh, I'll leave it up to you for your thoughts about the future of Title IX. I, I'll, I'm happy to go first. Um, and I was the sort of dawning down or saying that it was never gonna be fully resolved. I don't think it's gonna go away. I don't think those 37 words will change anytime soon. What we're gonna be faced and continue to, um, we're gonna evolve as a society with it, I think. We never would have talked about, 20 years ago, trans athletes. And now we're having big conversations about trans athletes. We talk about uh, gender neutral bathrooms. And I will tell you, 20 years ago, we never would have had that conversation. And then we thought we kind of resolved it, and now it's back as a hot issue again. I only just saw an interview on a, one of the news shows uh, with a person saying, you know, it's all because they let boys go in girls' rooms and girls go in boys' rooms that the world is a, as an ugly place. And I thought, is it 2022 or is it 1962? I, I, I'm a little confused. Um, I think it will be continually evolving. I think that's a good thing, though, because it should evolve. It shouldn't be static. If it just sits there as 37 words without dialogue, interpretation, conversation, and grow as our society grows and changes, then to me, it is not dynamic enough because we're different and we continue to be different. I don't think the struggle will ever not be real because I think as we evolve as a society, it will continue to be a challenge. I don't think it's gonna go away. I don't think it'll be voted out in a way and, 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 and erased. But I also think that that we're just going to be on a journey, and it's going to be a long journey. It takes me a minute because I got to turn turn the mic on. But a um, couple things. I think for me, and we do I do a lot of so we have that annual board NCAA BOG Board of Governors Sexual Campus Violence. Uh, education requirement, and it's left up to the institutions on how that, how you navigate that, and what that looks like for you. Um, I have a partner who I am super proud of, and so lucky uh, to be a gender, uh, women and gender studies scholar, a Black sexuality scholar, a Black studies scholar, and one of the programs that um, she administered for us a couple years ago for athletics was around the social constructs of masculinity, and femininity what that means and what that looks like in our relation to our sexuality, to our, our gender. Um, and I, I think, Donna, I, I'm sure you're right, but what I would like to see somehow is, as a society, if we can understand how these social constructs play into the power that is given to people at top to continue to kind of um, oppress in, in a way, so whether it's around gender, whether it's around race, ethnicity, if we continue, to, if we can somehow break these things down a little bit, so like Dr. S said, we can just see the humanity in people, again, that's a long way to go, but it would be something that I would like to see. I think a lot of things then, you know, get deregulated because there aren't these, you know, these power, power plays and power positions that, you know, require legislation just so people you know, can use the restroom, or so people uh, can have an opportunity and participation. Uh, so as long as I think these social contracts continue, continue to stay in play, our um, ideologies and, 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 and buy into them, the power at the top will continue, and we'll be on this perpetual evolution, I think, of uh, how we navigate, you know, Title IX and other related laws. Um, I think the other thing, so uh, Dr. Leslie Ir Irvine, she's currently, and I don't know if she's a doctor, I might have just given her a title. Um, she's the athletics director at Colorado College. Uh, years ago, I went to an NCAA inclusion forum 
Uh, must have been around 2013, 2012, and at the time she was a senior associate athletics director for Bowling Green State University. And she was given some recognition, just a huge shout out at the inclusion forum for all of her hiring practices that related uh, to women. So she hired a lot of women coaches, hired a lot of women administrators at the inclusion forum. They were like, hey, Leslie, this is awesome. Hats off to you. These are you know recent hires that she made. And everybody loved her and appreciated for it. I had an opportunity to meet her at the inclusion forum that year and have since been able to do work with her, um, which has been awesome. But when I met her then, she was like, I wasn't doing anything that I felt needed worthy of recognition. I was doing you know, what I felt should have been done. So I think uh, your president made a, a note about it and both uh, panelists have made a note about it too. There is this idea of compliance and there is an idea of commitment. And I think if we are on the edge of commitment where we look at women, where we look at gender, men, people, whomever, uh, as a way again to serve a, a, an inherent value in who they are, um, then everything else kind of falls into play. We won't necessarily look at it as something, you know, Dawn said, as a checking the box, right? It'll be something that we hold as a value. I think as your president uh, mentioned in, in the letter that was written, we'll look at it as a value, something that, that's philosophical. How do we make sure that everybody has what they need to be successful? What are we doing for our budgets to make sure that softball has an opportunity to be successful? What are we giving in terms of funding to make sure that football has what they need to be successful and competitive. Um, what are we making, you know, what are we doing to make sure that due process uh, for Title IX and sexual assault cases uh, is, is, um, is fair just because people have inherent value and right and access to these things because it's something that we believe uh, to be true rather than something we feel like we need to make sure we comply with uh, so we don't get in trouble and so we make sure that we have our funds. If we even change our mindset just a little bit to get on that commitment side, I think we make huge strides in what this looks like for all of us in many years to come. Beautifully said. Um, in terms of the future and picking up on kind of this theme of um, actually enforcing, right? Um, that, that if we're 50 years out and we still have not um, fully uh, committed to enforcement, um, uh, it, uh, there, there needs to be some kind of incentive in order for that to happen. And um, one of the things, especially um, in terms of this issue about athletic scholarships for women, um, NCAA institutions are more likely to be in compliance with NCAA rules than they are to be in compliance with the federal law in terms of Title IX. And, one of the reasons why that happens is the fact that the NCAA has penalties when you violate the rules. Uh, the federal government certainly has a penalty structure in place, but they have never withdrawn federal funds from a school. They've, nev they've never really made a school pay the price um, in a meaningful way that would prevent schools from being serial violators. Um, over a 50 year span of time, schools just continually try to get away with, with not really complying or, or doing PR so that it looks like they're complying, but they really aren't. Um, and there, and there's, a lot of, um, there, there's a lot of that kind of smoke and mirrors um, Title IX compliance that goes on. So, so we have that picture that um, we've got um, some people who are calling for the federal government to do exactly that, um, that, that you have to sanction in the next couple of years. Um, but beyond that, though, it's an exciting time because of the fact that, um, that we, have, um, uh, we have a mobilization of educational efforts. So um, we've got something called Demand 9, and for any of you who are interested in working in this space, doing education with students. Um, Demand 9 has um, paid fellowships for college students to participate in their educational programs and then to pass the word along. So this is one of the 50th anniversary initiatives. Um, and I think that coming out of that, especially with the amplification of social media, um, I think we're going to see more and more generations who really understand what Title IX compliance is and, and what we can be doing. Um, I think, I, I, I think in, a, uh, in, in an area that 
that that it is built into athletic compliance. We have this very interesting thing with Title IX as a piece of civil rights legislation because when it comes to athletics, it's the, the Title IX's regulations say that 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 we can have um, separate um, and equal. We can have separate but equal. Okay. Very, very unusual for a piece of civil rights legislation and in point of fact an anomaly. Um, so that's what delivers us to men's athletics programs and women's athletics programs. Um, and, and of course that gender binary needs to be critiqued. Um, it needs to be critiqued in terms of non-binary um, students. Um, it needs to be critiqued in terms of transgender. It needs to be critiqued in terms of whether or not this current system is the system that best serves our population. So, so there, there are people who are working on this and trying to revision, sort of how do we revision Title IX in a way that is a 21st century view of, um, of what student life is really like um, because these regulations were all negotiated out in, in 1972 um, at a time when, when you could say, you could, you, you could say that girls were not interested in sports or women were not interested in sports. And you actually see that in the regulations. You see this regulation that says, well, you have to prove that you're interested. Um, that's going to be one of the criteria we evaluate. Well, 50 years later, girls and women have certainly proved that they're interested. So, and, and, and that negotiation around those regulations designed to protect football, the revenue generators, um, built into those regulations, I think we're going to see those um, getting unpacked um, in a way, um, and, and, and it's going to lead us to other ways of thinking about things. Um, so that's sort of the future of this, I think. Um, and, but I think it's also going to fuel how Title IX is going to thrive. Um, uh, as, lo as, long, as long as we're educated, um, as long as we're engaged, um, uh, if, if, we're, if we're ignoring Title IX, I, I think we're in trouble. I just wanted to add on one thing that you said, Dr. S, is that um, when I think about, we here are, we're, we're complying with NCAA, most institutions are, are very focused on the NCAA compliance, not as focused on the federal compliance. Right. It's interesting because the NCAA has put in a system of penalties and all. But, and I don't know about the two of you, but I want the NCAA to do more. I want to hear them talk more about the educational piece. I want to hear them talk more about the equity piece. I think that they do have some structures in place and some boxes that get checked off. But I, I, I continually look at NCAA and wish, could you step up a little bit more and talk about the importance of this? Because I think that is critical. It's not just about the numbers, it is about what is right and what is just, and I would love to hear that more from them, but I don't, I, I, I'm a little jaded sometimes to think it is more about revenue generation. And, and I was a college athlete, and I, I oversee athletics within my division uh, right now at Montclair State, and I love it. However, I get disappointed with NCAA because I wish they would do more in terms of the just piece and the, the social justice piece. If, if I can follow up on that. Um, I think the NCAA has demonstrated in recent memory that, that they are not committed to gender equity. Um, the, the NCAA women's basketball tournament and the, um, uh, the, the viral images that went around the world um, in terms of the substandard second class treatment of women. Um, that, that is the difference between talking the talk and walking the walk. Um, and, 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 you know, it's the tell, right? It's the tell in the system. Um, I, th I think another future area would, which has been um, evaded so far by the NCAA um, is that, that, that they've kind of been let off the hook because of the fact that there is a belief that Title IX does not apply to the association. Um, I, I think, you know, we've got a very narrow ruling in Smith versus NCAA, very narrow. Um, and I think that this is going to be another area where, if for the future, I think we're going to see people coming at that um, and, and, and sort of cutting down those, um, 
those, um, uh, th those ways that, that, um, that uh, associations and groups can, um, can evade their responsibility. Um, yeah, not that I have an opinion on that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, just to follow up your, your your piece about social justice. So I, I agree. I think the NCAA is constantly given opportunities, and they keep following the bag. Even recently, just a couple weeks ago, like, I'm not even sure what that Las Vegas ballroom was, and I don't even know if it was NCAA. But the fact that something like that could actually go through um, as a good idea is interesting. I don't like. I don't. Interesting to, is good. That's yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, but to the social justice piece, and I think this is what I was hoping I was getting at in terms of mm, student-athlete engagement, responsibility, involvement. The, whatever changes were made to the Women's Basketball Championship were because the women in the, in the field posted pictures about it, they posted um, their comments about it. You know, they were kind of joking about it, but they were basically like, this is ridiculous. And it actually got people on board. It got people rallied around like, what the heck is this? And then, so the WNBA, even, if you look at some of those women, the things, you know, that they, that they did from um, uh, Raphael Warnock when he first won the election, when um, Kelsey Plum said something in an interview that said, we're not looking to get paid what men are getting paid, we're looking for an equal share of the revenue. So my thing is, it's going to students, players, there has to be a level of involvement where you are taking up your own interests, where you're rallying together uh, to kind of make sure from a social justice aspect, you're being served in a way that you feel um, is appropriate, equal, and hold administrators and associations accountable to those things. Thank you. Wow, a lot to think about. Um, so I'd like to move into the, the Q&A session. I see a couple of you, as I boot up my computer again, um, uh, did submit some questions through the QR code, um, <coughs> one of which, while I get this computer going, I do recall um, there was a, a member that wanted, I think Don, um, or anybody who wants to elaborate, um, wanted to hear more about what, what we mean when we're talking about the Dear Colleague letters that have, that have come out. Sure, so um, the Dear Colleague letters came out or come out as recommendations from the federal government of things that potentially, I'm gonna simplify this a little bit, but potentially you should do, um, and I'll, I'll, with, with Title IX, let's say, we'll take that, but there are other Dear Colleague letters that come out, but that this is what we would recommend that you do. We're seeing some things that we potentially think need to be rectified or fixed within your system. And so it was to college and university education system, we think you should fix these things. Here are the recommendations that we would make for you to do. That then got followed up with each time with actual changes in the regulations. So it was sort of the precursor to here are going to be the changes. But what was, I think, when the 2011 um, Dear Colleague letter came out, it was very, very clear from, at least for me, from local lawmakers that you need to do these recommendations because those regulations are going to change. And so it was, uh, you would be really great if you did this, but it really wasn't. It was, you need to do this, get this moving, because the regulations are coming. And so the, the biggest ones of recent have been in 2011, 2014, 2017, um, and now we are sort of in a, a gray area where we're waiting for the next round of approved regulation changes that we're going to be told we need to put into place. And so we're still straddling really two political administrations right now because Biden administration, Trump administration saw how we were managing sexual assault, harassment, and discrimination in the educational system. They see it differently. And so we're operating in one system right now waiting to be able to move into the other system and it's taking a little longer. We thought it was gonna be in May of 2020 that we were gonna be able to move into the new system and that has been um, stalled 
at this point. So I hope that helps a little bit about the, the, what it means and the Dear Colleague letter. I want to add this one thing in case it helps anybody from a more uh, basic foundation. When I got to, when I started working on college, uh, in Capitol Hill, I was still in law school, and I would get, and people would talk about, oh, you know, the Dear Colleague letter, the Dear Colleague, and I'm like, what are these things that everybody keeps talking about, these Dear Colleague, they're called Dear Colleague letters because they're actually inner office or um, they're peer-to-peer -peer letters that start with Dear Colleague, because it's like something that I would write like, we, you know, we would write to each other like, oh, hey, dear, and it comes off as dear colleagues. So it's actually a peer-to-peer -peer or office-to-office -office or, you know, that become um, these, you know, like Don described, more recommendations. But when I saw my first one, I was like, ah, that's what that is. It's like a long thing that's written, and they have them in the mailboxes. There are tons of them um, that kind of flow day-to-day -day and week-to-week. -week. And it starts off with dear colleague, and it lists kind of, um, whatever the recommendation is or whatever the thoughts are that ultimately end up making their way to our regulations. Thank you. Uh, I'm in a group with other Title IX coordinators at our um, neighboring universities and colleges and we are not allowed to start off our email with dear colleague. Uh, because that is, um, and as far as the one that happened, I can tell you that the one that kicked this all off in the last 15 years or 12 or 13 years, I remember it was April 4th, 2011. And we all that work in the Title IX world kind of remember where were we at that moment. And I remember the office that I was in at the University of Albany at the time. So. It was, uh, it really did change the landscape. And thank you for clarifying, and thank you, Jackson, for the question. Um, we do have a, a, a different question here. I'll try to phrase this as best. Um, it's feedback there, so I'll just, um, <coughs> so of a student athlete who is born um, sex assigned as male, and it transgendered and identifies as female, and they play for, uh, or, or rather the opposite of that, I'm sorry, and they play for a male sports team. What are the thoughts as it, as it relates to gender equity or equity in, in general? Do you need clarification about the question? Yeah, I, I need just a little clarification. So, uh, I think the key terms is that a person is born um, assigned at, at birth sex of male. They transition uh, to, to female and they wish to play and they're allowed to play on a women's sports team as a women athlete. What are your thoughts as it relates to gender equity or equity in general? I have a couple of thoughts on this, but I, I, I really would like to hear your thoughts on this. Um, yeah. But, but I'll, I'll just offer like a couple, a couple of ideas. Mm -hmm. um, some of you probably follow the case of Leah Thomas, the swimmer at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, There, is, there has been, at times, equivocation in terms of um, the, there, there had to be an evolution in terms of Title IX's application on the basis of, of gender. Um, and, it, and it's on the basis of gender that we make this determination. How do we remove a barrier that is based on um, a, a discriminatory act on the basis of gender? Okay. Uh, uh, how I explain that? Well, I don't know if you're following the logic of that in terms of how Title IX can apply. Okay. Uh, this is my concern with what is happening in the country right now in terms of transgender athletes. The kind of rough numbers that I've been able to find about NCAA athletes is that there are about 30 to 40 across all divisions. 30 to 40 transgender athletes across all divisions. In approximately 40 plus states now, 
we have laws that are pending or have passed to bar transgender athletes from participating on the team that they identify with. And, and I think to myself, how, what, what kind of a state investment do we have in the regulation of people's bodies to have 40 plus states in the union going after 40 college athletes? Or states who are passing those laws where there are zero transgender athletes? I think that as Americans, as citizens, that's something for us to be thinking about. The imposition of state power over bodies. Because that is something that we all share. We may, we may not understand the dynamics of it, but the fundamental underlying piece of it is something that, that in, in, a very, in a very specific way means that at some point in time that state power can be coming after you. Um, and, and, and that's the reason why we all have an investment in what's going on with that, in my view. Okay. Um, caveat, not a position that, uh, from Ithaca College. <laughs> but, but having studied this for a long time, you know. So, so it, is, it is about gender discrimination to have an individual who has a gender identity who wishes to play on the team that they identify with. That is a gender issue covered under Title IX, okay. But then we also have these other dynamics as well. Um, and, and certainly, um, and, and this is where we could, we could have a whole class just on this. Um, and I would love to sort of engage in terms of all of the different ways that you are thinking about this right now. Um, but um, but that, 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 you know, with the time we have, um, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave it there, but we, we know there's a whole lot there. Absolutely. Any other comments? Or, um, okay. So um, <clears throat> there were a few more questions that we got to. I, I agree with you, any of these topics we could spend two hours on individually alone, let alone the myriad of different things that we discussed tonight and did so fruitfully, and thank you, panelists, um, again. The last question I'll ask is just a general one we have in our audience here, and thank you again, and for those that are watching. Sorry, folks that are watching, if you didn't, if you didn't have an opportunity to submit a question, this is a public, uh, Bench and there are bots and things out there that try to interfere on the YouTubes. Um, so uh, I apologize that you, if you didn't have an opportunity to, to submit a question. So the last question is kind of, uh, I hope, something that all of us are thinking. We have an abundance of student athletes here, administrators, top senior level administrators, athletic directors, coaches, Title IX people, Athena students, um, counselor support advocacy, um, some work we, that we do to support um, academic and other endeavors. So, and we're here at an institution that has a history as being um, uh, up until 2005 not a co-ed institution. And there's still some thoughts about that even though that happened 17 years ago. So, what advice can you give all of us collectively as we try to progress and we try to do what the spirit, I believe, of Title IX is, is to evolve and change over time and to support one another in, in a, in a in the ways that we can continue to hopefully thrive as an institution, individually, professionally. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Any parting thoughts, pearls of wisdom? Um, I think I said it a couple times. So I would say first, be involved as much as you possibly can with your athletics participation, the governance of your athletics participation, now Mike, you'll probably go to the convention in January. So in January, um, we will go to the NCAA convention, all divisions one, two, and three, and vote on proposed legislation that really governs how we operate, how your participation happens. One of the things on um, as proposed legislation is for the Student Athlete Advisory Council to have a vote on the business floor. 
So divisions one, two, divisions one and two, uh, SAC already has a vote on the business floor, so proposed legislation will allow division three this year um, to have a vote on the business floor as much as you possibly can. Be involved with your own governance and include your athletics participation. That includes, as again, uh, your local, state, and federal government. Do not lean away from the local and state pieces. Like we talk high level about federal uh, government legislators. Um, what Dr. S pointed out is that state governments have so much power in terms of regulation of what that looks like for you, your body, your participation, your rights, everything else. So pay as much attention as you can to your local, state, federal um, elections. I think, I guess more just philosophically and from a value perspective, um, I imagine you know, you probably a closer knit group of, of, of folks, um, of individuals, student athletes. Uh, you gotta really get to know each other. Like I think you know the humanity, Dr. S pointed out, um, is really important. Like you have. To, my hope is that you understand what's at stake for the person next to you. I think um, when we talk about I put it in my notes somewhere. When we talk about liberation, my goal, my hope, period, for people is to experience prosperity and liberation. It makes it a lot harder for people that are on the margins to be able to do that. So if you're part of a disenfranchised, disenfranchised, marginalized, oppressed, or otherwise a group of folks, it's a lot harder for you to experience and exercise that. Think about if we are able to get the margins closer to the center, have them experience liberation and prosperity. That ultimately, again, a lot of these regulations get freed up. The people in the center who experience the most freedoms, liberties, will also experience more liberation. Once we, um, I guess, liberate the margins, the center also becomes, I guess, more liberated. These ideas that we have around these social constructs begin to go away. Um, other things, uh, again, begin to happen. Uh, for the center as well. So I would say governance structure, student athlete level, local state government, and again, really get to understand the humanity, each other, what prosperity and liberation looks like for the margins, uh, so the center can also get larger or stronger as well. I would say three simple words. Um, listen, learn, and advocate. Listen to what's happening around you. Push your comfort level. Not just what's happening at Wells, or what's happening in the community, or what's happening in New York State, but look around at what's happening in our country. Learn what you can about what is happening to all people. People who are marginalized, people who are in the majority, women, men, non-binary, can laundry list, right? Uh, undocumented, are immigrants. Learn what's happening. Pay attention to what's happening in other states. We talked about watching TV last night and watching the Georgia election. And I, I, I'm not going to judge, but I saw a few of you didn't know what we were talking about. It was a critical election last night. These are things you need to pay attention to. And then advocate. Not only advocate for yourselves or for your peers, but advocate for those who may not have a voice or may not have as strong of a voice as you do. You're at a wonderful college, you are surrounded by learned people, you're learning things as you are here. Take that voice and go out and help others. Not only related to things we're talking about today for Title IX and uh, gender equity, but just in general about the humanity piece. Listen, learn, and advocate. That is what's going to make the changes in our society that need to happen. Um, I'm not sure I can, can add much to that, but um, you know, it's an interesting thing in terms of the college sports space, which is what I've spent most of my time looking at. And um, I've, I've, I've looked at two things. I've looked at um, uh, exploitation issues around um, major college sports 
and, and notably the major revenue sports that um, the labor of those sports um, is um, produced by primarily um, black and brown men. Um, so we, we have an entire industry that has been built on that labor and yet, and yet the system has suppressed that labor. They've, not they've intentionally not recognized it and compensated the labor appropriately. And in the meantime, we have um, sports television that it was built on it. So we, we have the flickering idea of ESPN, and now we've got the SEC network. We have ESPNU, we've got Fox Sports. That's what that labor has helped to produce, not just you know, at Alabama or a specific school, but it's, it's um, <coughs> enriched um, corporations like Nike. Um, it's uh, global corporations. So, so we've got that dynamic going on. And then we've got um, the gender equity dynamic um, viewed through a racial lens as well. Um, and so, so we've got, and, and all of this um, uh, emanates out of the same center, okay? We, we think somehow that the major football powers are privileged, the, the, the players who play are privileged, but they're exploited. And then we have um, athletes in the non-revenue generators that are, their value is suppressed. And quite literally, the NCAA suppressed the value of women's basketball. Um, it contractually, contractually, um, in terms of limiting what that was. So, so th these are shared. These are, are shared issues. Okay. When you start to uh, unlock the system, then it empowers more people. Okay. Um, and so, so you know, part of this discussion is seeing how all of these pieces come together, um, and that can empower. Um, so, so that, that's my sort of tip of the day to sort of look at this within a broader context, maybe. Thank you so very much. Before I ask you all to join me in thanking our panelists, I wanted to thank this audience. Um, we're a small school here. On any given day, I hear between 320, 340 uh, total students, 300 that is, uh, 2040. And um, as at one point uh, there were I mean, primarily the students in the audience here, we can all see that. And at one point, there were over 90 people in this room. And uh, so thank you, thank you uh, for making this event so, so attended. And I'm sure on the YouTubes, we're going viral, so we can add much more of that. Please join me in thanking our three esteemed and, and, and thoughtful and thought-provoking and, and committing to so many things that I know I'm going to be thinking about for the next days or months or weeks. Uh, please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs> that concludes tonight's event. Thank you very much again for attending. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I almost did it.